the first lady. It's not a job that's actually in the Constitution, but that's just because in 1787, women hadn't been invented yet. And even though first lady is not an official role, they've been important figures in the country from the very beginning. From the earliest days, America's first ladies were referred to as lady presidentress or Republican queen. The term first lady didn't come into use really until Dolly Madison's time. The fourth first lady pioneered the practice of championing social causes. She helped orphan children and supported women's rights. And it's said that at Mrs. Madison's funeral, President Zachary Taylor eulogized her as the country's first lady. The first time that title was ever used. That's right. Dolly Madison was the first first lady. But she didn't know it because President Taylor only called her that at her funeral. If I were Dolly Madison, I would be dead, but also I would have been so pissed at Zachary Taylor because before him, people were calling her Lady Presidentress or Republican Queen. And those are so much cooler as names. Then at her funeral, some dude is like, no, she was the first lady. If I was her, I'd be getting out of that casket like, what'd you say? Bitch, you call me Queen Supreme. Oh, first lady, Queen. But while the idea of a first lady has been around from the beginning, the job as we know it today didn't really kick off until the 1930s. You know, it's like how, for years, Netflix was a company that sent DVDs in the mail. But that's not what people think of as Netflix now. And the first streaming on demand first lady was Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt really innovated the first lady's role as a public communicator. She wrote thousands of columns, 27 books. She participated in hundreds of radio shows. She felt that her role was to really reach out to the American people and to learn from them about what they wanted in policy. First lady had taken to the road and traveled hundreds of thousands of miles. Going right to the source of the country's pain during the Depression, meeting miners in Appalachia, challenging Southern Democrats to support anti-lynching legislation, and during World War II, visiting internment camps where Japanese Americans were imprisoned simply because of their race. The First Lady was often alone at the wheel, driving herself cross-country. Now that is ballsy as hell. Eleanor Roosevelt was so politically active, she visited the Japanese internment camps that her husband set up. It's so classic for a wife to go around cleaning up her husband's mess. She was probably at those internment camps like, I'm sorry, he just gets a little racist sometimes. Work has been really stressful. He's not normally this way. Really, really he isn't. And she even took road trips by herself which was very gutsy in the 1930s. There was no phones, no GPS, you know? Although I guess it's hard to get lost when there were only like, what, two roads in the entire country? Okay, young buck, listen up. You wanna get from California to the White House, pay attention. You wanna turn onto road, are you listening? You wanna turn onto road one and then you're gonna drive straight on road one and then you'll be there. And once Eleanor Roosevelt realized that she could use her position to bring attention to the issues that were important to her, every first lady who followed did the same. Lady Bird Johnson sought to beautify the nation and took an active role in the Head Start program for early child development. Barbara Bush advocated for literacy, as did Laura Bush. In 1962, Jackie Kennedy Onassis created the White House Historical Association. Betty Ford was vocal about women's issues. She supported the Supreme Court's ruling on Roe v. Wade, which made abortion legal, and she supported the Equal Rights Amendment. She openly discussed her breast cancer and mastectomy. When Michelle Obama was first lady, one of her key initiatives was to push for healthier nutrition and food choices. That translated into a change for public school lunches around the country. In the 80s, Nancy Reagan appeared in a popular sitcom to boost her Just Say No campaign. Who's talking about Mrs. Reagan? I'm concerned about drug abuse, especially among the young. Wow, that is commitment. Nancy Reagan was so determined to stop drug abuse she even went on a sitcom to speak out on it, which would be impossible to do today. I mean, TV shows are so much more adult now. I mean, it's easy to tell Gary Coleman not to do drugs. 
It's a lot harder to try and do that on Euphoria. Just say no, Zendaya. Bitch, you should have been here season one. But it's through that activism that first ladies get to show who they really are and how they want the world to change. You know, Michelle Obama cared about health. Hillary Clinton cared about children and education. Melania cared about stopping cyberbullies. And say what you want, but her agenda got done. And the thing about being a first lady is that they're not just expected to promote social causes. They're also expected to be style influencers. Jackie Kennedy's pullbox hats, Nancy Reagan's red dresses, Hillary Clinton's pantsuits, or Pat Nixon's Xena cosplay. But of course, all this attention also means that first ladies get subjected to intense scrutiny by the press. And it's not something that they've been happy about. To be the first lady may be the most difficult job in Washington. Martha Washington famously said the role of first lady can sometimes feel like a state prisoner. Michelle Obama wore a pair of shorts, just regular pair of mom shorts, and an uproar ensued, days of video uh, commentary and pictures and debate about whether it's okay for a first lady to wear shorts. Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel, was blasted in the papers uh, for being a pipe-smoking hillbilly from Tennessee. Jackie Kennedy called the press harpies, and she hated the constant attention. Gus Truman felt very uncomfortable, very ill at ease with all the fanfare and the attention of the press. There was a famous uh, incident where she was doing a christening of a ship, and she went to break the bottle, and they forgot to score the bottle ahead of time, so she's banging it and banging and ba and it just won't break. <laughs> She was humiliated. She told her husband, I'm not doing another public appearance. Ah, oh, poor Bess Truman. I honestly feel bad for her because we've all had that moment where we just can't open a jar of peanut butter. But imagine if the entire country was watching you struggle with that jar. Uh, almost got it, everybody. <laughs> Hold on. Try running hot water over it. I tried that already. If you ask me, the person to blame is the one who started this whole tradition. Like, who thought it was a good idea to christen a new ship by smashing it with a champagne bottle? You don't christen a new car by slashing the tires with a samurai sword. And honestly, all the first ladies are in an unfair situation because none of them asked to be in that position. Martha Washington was right. It is sort of like a prison. Although it's weird to say you feel like a prisoner when you own slaves yourself. Sometimes I just feel like I can't leave. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Mrs. Massa, I think I do. But maybe the most fascinating thing about first ladies is that even though no one votes for them and they kind of make up the job as they go, just by virtue of being married to the president, they can end up having a lot more power than many elected officials. The first lady is the most powerful woman in the country because she has the ear, first thing in the morning and last thing at night, of the f most powerful man in the country. Going back to the very first first lady, Martha Washington, and the second one, Abigail Adams, both of them were politically involved. They were involved in cabinet decisions. They were involved in campaigning. These women were political partners. Nancy Reagan was pulling a lot of the strings, calling many of the shots from President Ronald Reagan's first campaign for the White House back in 1980 to his Cold War ending triumph in 1987. Hillary Clinton became more involved, obviously, in policymaking than any first lady before her. She had an office in the West Wing. Uh, Bill Clinton even ran on the slogan, buy one, get one free. In 1919, Edith Wilson was unofficially running the country after her husband Woodrow suffered a stroke. That's insane, man. Not only have first ladies influenced the president, Edith Wilson ended up running the government. And by the way, that totally screwed the vice president over. I mean, like 90% of the vice president's job is being there in case the president goes down. So that's like being Tom Brady's backup, and then he gets hurt, but then Giselle comes out like, no, 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 I got this. Get back on the bench, loser. I throw for my husband. So as the Biden administration gets underway, history suggests that Jill Biden will likely be a major part of it. Because first ladies always have been. And if you don't know, now you know.